we'll start. I've had the pleasure of being an assistant coach, and I spent my first five years as an assistant in uh, at the college level, at the community college level, and okay. it was great because I had a vars or I had a head coach at that time who really would allow me to kind of spread my wings and do some things. And I've tried to take that approach with within my program now. Um, and I think that's one thing that as varsity coaches, it can be tough to do. Sometimes we want our assistants to spread their wings or our low level coaches to spread their wings. But at the same time, we want it all to be going in the same direction so that we, you know, we're accomplishing the goals that we have set where we're trying to, you know, whether it's win games, turn around a program, whatever it is. Um, so that's where I want to want to start with your assistant coaches. And let's throw in our lower level coaches with that. So if you have a JV coach or you have a freshman coach, we'll kind of encompass all of those is how do you give them the freedom to do their thing, but at the same time, keep it going in the direction you want the program to go in. And I'll, I'll just open it up and see what you guys have, what thoughts you might have. And coach, um, coach Baker, this, I don't know if you've been a varsity coach at other schools or you've been lower level coach, but maybe if, since this is your first year, how have other people done that? Or how do you think it's going to play out for you? Today? Well, to be honest with this is I've been a head coach before, but my last year as a head coach was 1999. So at a okay. small school, actually in the same league I'm in now, that school's no longer, it's, it's gone to a bigger school, bigger division. Uh, but uh, so I started as a high school coach when I was, I think my first year, I was 23 years old um, coach there for, it was a brand new school, started the program from scratch. So I never really had a var. I had very few kids. The first couple of years, I didn't have a varsity assistant coach. The last two years I was there, I only had a JV coach. We just finally got enough kids to get JV uh, program started. So then in 2004 and 2005, I was an assistant coach at a bigger school in Salem, uh, at Salem, Oregon. And then I've been out of coaching since other than some coaching my daughter's youth stuff, which kind of got me the bug the last few years to get sure. back in the high school. And I'm a small business owner. So my, my, my I had an opportunity this year. I have management in place that I don't have to spend as much time in my business. So I'm um, I'm, but anyways, I'm back in the high school game. So I was just talking with our girls coach last night, basically about this topic. How do I get, I have one assistant varsity coach right now, one JV coach. We're a small school, but we got 33 kids out. So we'll probably have a JV two program, which will probably be the only team in our league with that. So it's a small community football dominated for the last 30 years. Like okay. they went to the last two state championships, always really good in football. Um, girls program went to last two state championships, good girls basketball, good volleyball has won the state title last two years. So it's a community that knows how to win. Very mm -hmm. small community. Um, uh, it's probably, it's a strong Catholic community, kind of like coaching at a private school in the public setting as much as you could. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, this is a good topic. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to listen probably more than talk. Uh, okay. So I, I, I'm, I was just talking to my, the, like I said, the girls head coach last night, how do I get, because I'm, one thing I took away from Steve Kramer's was, was this talk less, because you can see already, I just get in practice and I just go and I just go sure. and I'm just passionate and I just go. And, and so that's going to be my biggest thing. But I've also been in practices where I just stand there. I don't want my assistant coaches doing that. So I'm, I'll, I'll shut up now and let you guys <laughs> teach me. <laughs> but hey, hey, coach, coach Pitts, I, I'm going to ask you, um, you know, you've been there five years and you've, you've had JV coaches and freshman coaches, I'm sure. Um, how do you keep them going in the same direction with what you're doing at the varsity level? It's, it's difficult at times because like um, sometimes they have a different job that kind of um, will take them away from being able to attend like, uh, like camps and stuff in the summer. But like, I try to invite them to, or I mean, I do invite them to everything that we do. Um, try to get them involved with like uh, four player workouts when we do it in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of uh, every once in a while, just get together, whether you like going out to get something to eat or something like that and just talk and just kind of make sure that you're on the same page and, um, and where you're going for the next year and answer any questions that they have. I, I think it's just... Um, 
the more you communicate like outside of it, then the less you have to do talking like during the, the practice times and stuff like that. And, okay. and let them have, uh, let them have, you know, like give them a group and let them go work with that group and uh, just tell them like, you know, you've already communicated what you expected. And I think it's, um, it's just kind of how I do it. Um, we've had a little bit of um, turnover with our coaching staff just because <clears throat> of like jobs and things like that. And uh, we're a small school, we're in D4 for Michigan. So we only got about 200 and about 240 kids in our high school ninth through 12th grade. So um, we're in the lowest level that we can be for basketball. Um, or actually, I'm sorry, we're in D3 right now, but we've been in D4 most of the time. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, that's what I do is just try to communicate as much as possible. And um, I, I don't think there's any secret. I mean, somebody else might have better ideas out there, but I just think the more that you talk, the better off that you are. Yeah, no, I, I would I would agree with that communication piece. And and Brian Ouellette, who is is on with us, is actually my freshman coach, um, and and I believe that communication piece is huge. Now we're going through a transition this year. Uh, we're a Division two high school, and in Michigan it goes Division one to largest two, three, and then four. Um, but Division two, we have about seven hundred kids in our in our high school. Uh, but our transition this year is. Uh, hiring a new JV coach. So uh, the one that I've had for my previous four years, uh, his son's in college playing college ball. He wants to follow that. Um, and I don't blame him. Uh, so we, we hired in a new coach. So we're kind of bringing people on board and a couple of thoughts that I have on it is we'll look at lower levels and I'm going to talk specifically about as an assistant coach at, at the lower levels. It, I try to make it flexible for everybody, but at the same time, have them understand that the reason we're putting in time is because our kids truly want to do a good job. They want to compete. They want to get in the gym. I mean, it's not like a community ed program where, you know, you're, you're opening it up and just whoever wants to come in comes in. That is how we run our lower levels. Um, to a certain extent, it's a, kind of the middle school level is that way. But when you get to the high school level, you know, those kids are making a conscious choice that they want to be there and they want to be good at something. So as coaches, we need to put ourselves in a position to help them do that. And that means um, whether it's open gyms or four player workouts or going to a team camp that we need to provide some of these things. Now, the other part of that is you all have um, your own lives. Coaches are busy with work. Coaches are busy with families. Coaches are busy with everything. So I don't want to demand so much time from them that they're almost scared away or they just say, this is too much. I can't do it. So how I've done it is uh, in our, in fall, we'll start there in the fall. When we have our workouts, our four player workouts, I ask for every coach to choose one day a week to run two hours worth of workouts. So our freshman coach does say Monday, Mondays, JV is Tuesday and I'll do Wednesdays. Now, during that two hour workout, we're only allowed to work with four players at a time in Michigan. So we do 40 minute set time segments. So they want three 40 minute sessions um, and we can fit 12 players in. Now, again, in our, we're not a big school, but we do have 700 kids. Our freshman group is always our largest group. Uh, and there's roughly 20 to 22, 23 coaches or players who will want to attend those. Well, you're not fitting them all in because you have 12. So what we tell our kids is that you can sign up. I want you to try to sign up with your coach first. But if you're, if you're a freshman and that coach doesn't have any time slots that work for you, go to the JV level. And if there's open slots there, you can sign up with the JV coach. That's fine. If both of those don't work for you or they're full, look at the varsity time slots. So it, we do allow them to sign up in other areas, but we ask them to do it that way because as a varsity coach, I want to spend time with my varsity players and say a freshman comes in. It may be a freshman who doesn't make the team or that I'm, I just don't know anything about them. So the workouts can really change if you get a kid who's not very good in with your top player in your varsity. But at the same time, we want kids to know that there, there will be a place for you. Now, uh, coach, coach O, as we call him, um, is at the freshman level. 
he goes above and beyond because he has the, the time to, to do it. So he did like this week, he did his workout on Monday and he opened the gym back up for two more sessions on Friday. So he did two 40 minute sessions on his own. I always let my coaches do that. Now I ask them to, to go through me because I'm the one scheduling the gym a lot of times. So even though they want to, if I see that, you know, on the master schedule, volleyball's in there. Well, we can't have a session then. So, but it's not so much of a control thing from my standpoint as just making sure that we're honoring the in-season sports and we're, we're staying with what the athletic director wants and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's one way we do it. And I, I truly believe that every coach has one two hour segment a week that they can devote. They wanted to do it on the weekends. They could do it on the weekends. The other thing that we do is when we have an open gym and again, this is in the fall, Open gyms tend to happen on Sunday nights for us. They're an hour and a half typically, uh, but we ask that each coach be on a revolving schedule so that maybe the first Sunday, the freshman coach will run it. The second Sunday, the JV coach will run it. The third Sunday, I'll run it. Now, as the varsity coach, I'm there most of the time, even if it's not my session, but that allows for the coaches to just to be able to plan that, okay, this is my, my schedule for open gyms. I don't require everybody to be there every Sunday. I don't require coaches to do multiple workouts a week, just do one. And if you want to go above and beyond, then we're happy to do that. Uh, if you can't make it on a Sunday night, I tell the coaches, just communicate. We have a, a group text message that, that we use and we just say, Hey, I can't make it because whatever came up um, is by cover. And we've always been able to cover. I mean, there, there hasn't been a time. I do have an assistant coach uh, as well. So if we have the, the lower level coach, then I have my assistant. Uh, it's a unique situation there because my assistant is my dad. Uh, he doesn't live in Otsego. He, he lives about 20 minutes away down in Kalamazoo. Uh, and, and he will fill in wherever we need him. He is uh, kind of a semi-retired uh, just loves being around it. You know, my kids are in the gym, so he loves being grandpa to them and, and all that good stuff that comes along with, with coaching. Um, but at the same time, he is not in it. He's not trying to get a varsity coaching job. He's not going to move to another school. He's just there to help me. And if the freshman coach can't show up and I can't be there, I'll call him up and say, Hey, can you run this workout? He's fully capable. He's been a varsity coach. He's got a lot of experience. Um, but that's a unique situation where we have somebody who is willing to do whatever we can, but at the same time is also just fine showing up to practice and just helping where we need him to help. I mean, it's kind of whatever I ask him to do, he's usually on board for. Uh, I think that that's unique, but I don't think that that is, the only reason it's unique is because he happens to be related to me. I don't think it's unique in the sense that we all have somebody within our community or within our school that is probably willing to help us. And before I was the coach here, we had um, a gentleman and I don't know if the teacher was retired yet or he was just about to retire. But um, as I watched game film, when I first took the head coaching job, I'd say, who is this? And it, somebody told me who it was and I can't remember his name right off. But, uh, you know, he just loves helping out the program. He's been with the program for 10 years, whatever. When I came in, he, I think, actually ended up moving, but he helps another varsity team that's about 25, 30 minutes away from here as just a volunteer assistant. I mean, he just likes being in the gym. So that would be a person where if, if they are accountable and they're somebody who enjoys the kids and they like to run a workout or ask them to do it. I think that can save you some time. Um, and there are some logistical issues with that. And like, I don't have keys for my assistant coach to the gym all the time. So sometimes it's a matter of he's getting, my dad swings by my house, grabs my keys and takes them to the gym. But I've let the athletic director know that hey, he's our assistant or he's our volunteer. And I trust that he can do this. And my AD has been very, very good about, about that. Uh, but it is a matter of, you know, when can you pick up the keys? When can I get them back? But that's not enough of a hassle for me to say, we're not going to do it. Okay. So that's, that's the fall. When we get into the winter, um, when we're actually in season, 
the way that we utilize or the best way, and this goes to what you're saying, Coach Pitts, with whether it's going out to dinner or whatever it is you like to do, um, having communication. I really encourage you to make sure you have a group text going with amongst your coaches. Uh, we just started using WhatsApp. So I don't know if you guys have used that at all, but that's our communication tool for our players uh, and coaches. It allows you to make groups. It's free. It, at Facebook actually owns it, but it allows you to make a group for just coaches, a group for maybe the whole program. So when I send out a message to everybody, ninth through 12th grade, it goes to everybody. But then I have groups for just freshman players, groups for just JV players. It's pretty easy to set up and use, uh, but it's a great communication tool. When you text uh, the whole program, like on my phone, I have an iPhone, it only allows you to put 10 contacts in at one time. So then you're sending out multiple texts and that got to be a pain. So this WhatsApp was, was free and it does everything that we need it to do. But I can have group chats going with multiple groups. If you wanted to just put in your seniors, you can just make a group for seniors, that kind of thing, um, which, which I usually have because I ask them to make a lot of decisions for us, whether it's what do you want to do for warmups or how do we want to, what do we want to wear for um, shooting shirts? I mean, kind of let the seniors take charge of that and gives them, you know, some feel, feel good about, you know, running the program. Uh, but in, in the winter, we are in constant communication. It is really hard to get all of our coaches together to talk um, it, it, face to face. And especially now with everything that's going on with COVID, I mean, it's going to be even less likely to happen probably. Uh, I can't make it to all Coach O's ninth grade practices. I can't make it to our JV coaches practice all the time. I do try to make it to some, but depending on the game schedule or what I, I have three kids ranging from uh, second grade to ninth grade and they're involved with things. And I tell everybody that, you know, I, I'll be as supportive as I can, but I, I won't miss a game or I won't miss, you know, something that they're involved with at school uh, to attend a practice, but I can probably make the next one, that kind of thing. Um, that's why I stopped coaching at the college level and I coach at the high school level now because I was missing everything. That wasn't any, any fun. The high school uh, allows me to be to everything most of the time. Um, so having that group chat going and then utilizing whether you get a 10 or 15 minute time segment um, to talk to those coaches and just to catch up with them on how things are going. The one caveat I have to, to that 10 or 15 minutes is if a coach asks me, um, about a parent meeting. I always make time to go to that parent meeting. Now we do parent meetings um, at the varsity level, a little bit different. Um, I will only meet with parents on Monday nights. I found this and this, I'm, I'm deviating a little bit, but this is what I found is parents are always super eager to want to meet with you. Okay. And I will meet with any, and I will talk about playing time. I don't, I don't take that off the table. I'll talk. I have reasons why your kid doesn't play. I have no problem letting you know why they don't play. Uh, statistics typically back that up. Um, so that was not my, just my opinion all the time. I, I can show you. Uh, so I'll talk about playing time with players, but I will only meet on Monday nights. And the reason that is, is because Monday nights tends to be the one night my kids don't have any sporting events, any school events, anything going on. And I explained to them in the parent meeting that it's not because I don't want to meet with you. Like if I have an opening and I can meet with you at another time, I, I will. But 99% of the time, if I know Monday nights are my nights to meet with any parent or player that wants to meet, then we, may, we can make it work. If you ask me on a Thursday, it might be a 50-50 shot. But then if I say no, you're going to think, well, coach doesn't care. Coach is being mean. Coach is whatever. It's not that at all. I just don't want to miss my son's middle school basketball game to meet with you. He takes precedent. So, I mean, th those are kind of some of the things um, I I've opened up parent meetings. The, the player has to be present, has to be present. Any parent meeting I've ever had without the player there um, is almost a waste of time. So the player always has to be there. The second is uh, we only will meet on Monday nights. And the third is there has to be a second coach in the meeting or the athletic director. So if it's my freshman coach who is meeting with a parent, he can ask me, he can ask our JV coach um, to meet at whatever time he decides. Now he may not meet on Monday nights. He might've decided Thursday night was his night, 
but he can ask um, one of the other coaches to meet with him. Uh, otherwise, our athletic director is, is very, very open and willing to, to be in those meetings with us. Usually just sits there, doesn't say anything, but I never want it to be a, well, you said this, well, you said that. We've got a third party who's there. Uh, I've gone as far as asked other coaches in other sports if they would be willing to sit on a parent meeting. Um, it's just never come to that. I've been able to find somebody within our program, but our wrestling coach just says, yep, I'll go sit in on it with you. I just haven't needed him to do that yet. So that, that's a couple of, of things. Um, going back to uh, scheduling and keeping people on the same page, there are some, some absolutes that I have in our program that the coaches follow. We all play the same defense. And I don't know if you caught the defensive presentation I did earlier, but no matter what defense you play, um, we all run that. Uh, we do press a lot at the varsity level. The freshman team gets into pressing a little bit to teach some of the basics, but they don't press very often. The JV starts to add the press more often. So it's a laddered approach. And by the time they hit the varsity, they know the basics and now I'm fine tuning it. Uh, but that helps keep everything in order as well. Now, how they teach the press, I do give them drills. I give them a handout, but um, I'm not in their practice to know everything that, that they're doing. Uh, same thing within our offense. We run a motion style offense uh, and I give them some basic guidelines that we want to run. Uh, but if they have plays they want to run every once in a while, they can run plays. If they have calls they want to make for certain actions they're trying to do, that I give them the freedom to do that. And I tell them, you, your freshman team, you may not have a big kid and I might have a six, eight kid. So you can do different, you, you need to do different things than I do to be successful. Um, if I don't have a big kid, but you've got a freshman kid who's not going to play at any other level, but they're pretty solid on the low block, we need to, you can figure out some things where you can incorporate that kid into what we're doing. But it's all with the understanding of we're still running motion. We're still pass and cut through and we're still, you know, doing different actions, but you may run those through your post player. So that, that's kind of keeps us in the same track. Um, now going to spe specifically to assistant coaches. If you have a chance to have an assistant coach, uh, one thing that I ask any, at one time when I coached in college, I had three assistants at a time. So that was amazing because you can get so much done with three assistants when it's just yourself, as you said, you know, coach that you, it was just you, uh, it, my first year not Seagull, it was just me. Like there was no splitting groups up into two ends or at four hoops. I mean, you could, but the other end that you weren't at was probably not doing much good, <laughs> you know, almost useless. Yeah. Yeah. So we kept everybody together almost all the time, unless we're doing like two man shooting or something like that. That's pretty easy to break up. But if it was any conceptual stuff, we all worked together. Uh, so my first year I did not, I went from having three assistants in college to having no assistants. And now I have my dad who helps me out. Um, so I've kind of uh, had a bunch of different things, but uh, one thing I've asked of them is for them always to have a ball in their hands. This will save you a lot of time. It's super simple. Ask your assistant to have a ball because when the ball gets flung out of bounds, when it goes off somebody's foot, inevitable, somebody's going to chase it. Well, you got a whole ball rack of balls. Why are we spending time chasing that? I mean, we went only have an hour in the gym. So so I asked the assistant and I try to keep one too, but sometimes I have a clipboard or I've got something else that I've papers in my hand. I can't do it. Just have a ball. And when we need it, throw it in. And then when you walk by that ball rack, pick up another one. Um, and that, that helps your practices just flow a little bit. I'm laughing because just last night in practice, I had my kids standing on a baseline, literally against the gym wall. There's eight basketballs. Hey, we need a basketball. They were trying to get someone to run. I said, just turn around. It's right, right behind right. you. You know. So you're right. It just it happens. It, it's it's. Uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, we want to chase down the one ball instead of grab the the eight that are next to us. But if your assistant has a ball, they add into it. The other thing is, I use um, my assistant coaches for passers a lot of times. If they've got a ball and I say, hey, can you move over to the free throw line extended? They've, they've already got a ball in their hands. We're ready to start the drill. So it's not a matter of, hey, can somebody give coach a ball and then four people throw a ball at him? And, you know, he's 65 years old and, you know, you're going to hurt him. I mean, we just don't want him to do that. Uh, so that's, that's an easy one right there. Um, a lot of times your assistants and Coach Baker, this may go to, you know, you said sometimes I just stand there. 
I know that feeling. My first year as a college assistant coach, I stood a lot. And I think it was a matter of the head coach didn't have a ton of confidence in me yet. Um, the other was, I didn't know how to insert myself and to be useful. So I will often say to, to my, one of my assistants, you know, I'm going to have you run the, the rebounding drill or tomorrow in practice. I want you to run the first 10 minutes of our dribbling drills. Um, do whatever you want. You want to do two ball dribbling. You want to do one-on-one -on -one stuff. You want to do a small sided game. You come up with 10 minutes of practice. When you do that, one, I think there's some ownership that's created for that assistant coach uh, to come in. And even if they're not comfortable with it, doing five or 10 minutes of dribbling is, isn't too daunting. I mean, they know it's going to be over and sometimes they want more than that. I had one time I had an assistant coach that I uh, told him he could coach one team while I coached the other. And then I had the then two assistants um, be referees. Well, the, the guy that I had asked to coach the team was just out of college. I'm pretty laid back coach. I don't yell a whole lot. I don't scream. I don't talk to the refs very much. I mean, I'm just, I kind of under the impression that if you prepare them well enough in practice, then you should be, they should be ready to go and compete. Um, you know, he used to make adjustments and stuff, but I, I don't fly off the handle on things. This coach went, this is in practice. He went nuts. I mean, he went crazy. He was yelling and screaming and stomping. And, and I didn't want it. I'm like, what do I do? We're, we're scrimmaging. It's practice. I mean, so eventually we had a break in it. And I'm like, you got you to gotta settle down. The players need to know how to react in games but that's not you don't have to be me but it, they're they're so confused at what you're doing because i don't coach like that so sure you can get on them sure you can say stuff to them but don't change the whole dynamic of the team and the culture once you get the whistle that was a, a really awkward conversation to have uh with him but when you give them five or ten minute segments i think they can start to feel uh, through, you know, or they think through what, what drills do I want to do? You know, how am I going to talk to them about it? I've only got 10 minutes. I can't spend five minutes of it talking. So they have to start planning some of that stuff. And then as you get comfortable with them, you can make them, you know, Hey, you coach the blue team. I got the white team, that kind of thing. But I learned real quick. Don't, don't throw them in there until they've had a chance to kind of get their, get their feet wet a little bit. Um, so that's that. Those are a couple of um, a couple of small things that I do uh, in getting my assistance. I'd say the third one, and then we'll kind of switch topics here. The third thing is, um, I, if they have a suggestion, a lot of times a suggestion comes to me, and they expect me to be the voice. And I'll turn. My dad did this a lot, especially in his first year. Hey, you know, I think so and so should do this, or you know, we're not really doing this. Why don't you tell them? I mean, you've got a whistle too. And, you know, we don't want to stop practice all the time, but you can blow the whistle real quick and, and you can mention something to him. I mean, I, I know him well enough that I have confidence in what he's about to say. If you aren't in that position at somebody new, then you, you might blow the whistle and say, hey, coach, somebody has something to say. Um, but that is, that's an easy way to get them to time to talk and get the players used to listening to them because those players are going to have to listen to them during the games anyways. I mean, I, I don't have, I can't always turn around and talk to every player on the bench because I'm focused on what's on the game. Who does that? The assistant coach a lot of times. So they need to, the players need to hear the assistant coach's voice so that when they're directed during games, they know that somebody that can be trusted, somebody that the coach backs up, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. So those, those would be three things, have a ball, you know, give them a segment of practice and then give them a voice because they're going to need it on the bench. Do you, um, I was just going to ask, like, do you meet with parents just, um, regarding any topic at all? Just leave it like an open, I don't know if open door is the right word, but, um, like last year I had one that was like, it was like a no win situation. Somebody got mad because their, their kid didn't get like a all league award. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I don't know. Just something like that. Would... It, I, I, it is pretty open what parents can meet with me about. Now, I, I will say um, we've won a lot lately. Winning definitely tones the parents down. Uh, when you're not winning, they, they tend to have more of a voice. They always have a voice. I mean, somebody complains about something, but um, I, I do, I kind of have a systematic approach to parents as well. In the beginning of the year, we have our parent meeting and I use that as a time to talk about partnering with parents to make this the best experience their kid can have. And this is the entire program. This is not just my team. So this is freshman JV and varsity, but I talk about partnering with them. And that can be things like we need people to work the concession stands and we need people to help with fundraising. Um, we need, we do a team dinner at the varsity level. We need to do team dinners, um, somebody to help do those. And we ask just like I do my coaches where they do one, one day a week of workouts. We ask that parents would just for home games, will each of you pick one meal? throughout the season. And usually there's, and I, we need a parent to organize that. So usually somebody is like, I'll do it. I'll put an email chain together and, and send it out and have people select, you know, what works best for them. Uh, and I give them a few ideas. These are some things that guys like, this is, you know, this is when we need it here, that kind of thing that they need to know. Um, but I, that's how I start the conversation of, this is what we need you to partner with us so that your kid has the best experience. If you don't want to do a team meal, we don't have to do team meals. It's just something that I think that's going to take away from the kid's experience. Um, and I let them make the decision. Now, parents have always jumped in and, and done that. Um, concession stand, they're a little less likely um, to be enthusiastic about, but that's a fundraiser for us. We get some of that money. You know, unless you want parents, would you like to pay for um shooting shirts or jerseys or whatever or would, could you work one of the games this year you know when you give it to them that way it's a little bit different all right so i fast fast forward through through that part of it and i get into the um here's how i decide who plays i'm looking at their grades and academics first if you're not doing the academics you aren't going to be on the floor second i'm looking at your practice are you coachable are you a good teammate then I'm looking at what type of player are you? Are you good enough to be on the floor? Do you deserve the playing time based upon who else is in your position? So I give them kind of this whole list of things. And then it's like, how's the game going? You know, uh, are you playing well? Or did you turn the ball over three times in a row? But I say, all of these things go through my mind as I decide playing time. So as a parent, you're sitting up there and you're saying, well, Johnny could do better than Joey. He just turned the ball over. What you didn't realize was this is the academic situation. This is how the kid mistreated or said something rude to his teammate in practice the day before. This is um, how the coachable the kid is. They're not all like major mistakes, but then it ultimately comes down to playing time. Who am I going to pick? And I said, that's as a coach, you can feel free to ask me those questions, but I have to put all that together with how's the game going? And how are you playing? How's your son playing? And now I make a decision who gets to be in the game and who doesn't get to be. So there's a lot of things other than it's Joey versus Johnny kind of thing. Um, it, then once, once we get there, parents always have to email me to set up a meeting. Some parents text me, some parents try to call me, but it always ends up being, you need to email me. The reason I have them email me is because I can easily forward that or add our athletic director to that email. I keep him informed on everything. I don't need his input all the time. I don't need him to make a decision. I just need to make sure he's not blindsided. I have worked for three different athletic directors. All three of them have said they like how I communicate and keep them in the loop. The last thing your athletic director wants to do is to get an email from a parent and say, Hey, Matt, I heard about this. And you say, yeah, I know they told me too." Now, if they say, Hey, Matt, Susie, the mom of so-and-so emailed me, have you heard anything? I said, Nope. Which just happens sometimes. Um, they're not blindsided because I didn't know about it. But if I say, Oh yeah, I, I, they told me that on Monday. Yeah. They're not, I'm not going to be in good graces with them at that point. So if it's a good email, I forward the good emails. If it's a bad email, I forward the bad emails. Um, 
the thing that you want to make sure you do, and I know this is a long, this is a really long approach to answering your question, which I'm going to get to. The, the thing that you want to make sure um, that you're doing, and it's the hardest thing for all of us to do, is human nature. When they email you, do not email a book back to them. All you do is say, happy to meet with you Monday at six o'clock. Please make sure Johnny is there too period. Because what we want to do is give them a reason for all 47 questions that they asked us because their, their emails are going to be books. I mean, parent emails are long and I, I get, I'm a parent too. I, I understand it a little bit, but your reply is just a one line. Yep. I can meet at six or, Hey, does six or seven o'clock work better for you? Let me know, please. That's it. And then all those feelings and emotions you have and what you really wanted to say, you just got to swallow them. <laughs> I, I've seen some coaches get in big trouble because they're going to let the parent know it, it, email. It, that's not why they're emailing you. It's a paper trail. That's all. Keep your athletic director informed, set up a meeting. Uh, and you just got to keep that in mind. Why am I doing this? Just set up a meeting. All right. So once all that stuff is done, I will let parents um, meet with me about anything. If it is a question the kid has, the player needs to come talk to me first. Why didn't I play? Um, what do I need to do to get better? Those are kid questions. If it's a parent going through the kid, that's a much tougher one because the parent is saying, you're getting gypped out of time. Will that kid really stand up to their parent and say, no, the guy in front of me is better. He probably knows that, but the, the kid is probably not going to stand up to the parent and say that. So now you've got the kid asking the parent question. And Coach O talked on this in his ninth grade one a little bit. And uh, I think in ninth grade, it's much easier because in the ninth grade, parents control that the whole world of the kid. When they get to be juniors and seniors, they have more flexibility and they have more just, they, they think for themselves and, and stuff. So I've got to kind of like read between the lines sometimes. Um, if I think it's a parent asking the question through the kid, then we need to set up a meeting whatever it's about. If it happened to be like yours, the kid didn't get a, didn't get an award. The kid may be disappointed about that. This would be what I think is probably a pretty easy conversation for me. May not be easy for the parent. I nominate the players. I give the reasons why I believe they should get an award. Our conference coaches vote on them. We were, we were 20 and 0 in the league last year. And I nominated six players for awards. That's a lot in, in your conference voting. But we, we just decimated our conference. I mean, our conference championship game, we won by 30 points. So we were that much better than everybody. Um, and, and I thought those six guys were be, could have started and been a star on any team in our league. Um, one player did not get an award. He didn't get voted in. So I went to that player and I just said, I want you to know I... I nominated you. I gave the reason just like I did for everybody else. The other coaches vote and this is what they decided. I don't think it's right. I think you're deserving of an award, but there's not anything I can do. I think the player appreciated that, but was still quite disappointed that they didn't win an all conference award. Um, but yeah, if a parent wanted to meet with me about it, they could. Parents want to meet typically about two things. I found the first and foremost, 99% of the time is playing time. And I meet with them. I, I, I almost, I used to go with the, we're not going to meet about playing time um, because that's what everybody did. And then as I thought about it, I just thought, why don't we, I'm making a decision. I mean, I know why they don't play. Why can't I tell anybody? So I started, and I have parents who want to meet with me. Why aren't they playing? These are the, re you may not like what I say, but I'm going to tell you my reasons um, in a cordial manner, of course. Um, so that, that's, I'll meet with them about anything. Um, if it were something that was simple, like I had a parent call me last year. His son is a college football player this year. So he was a senior last year. He went up to do a college visit. Um, they were going to offer him a scholarship. And, and we knew this, um, but he was going to miss practice. He came and asked me and I said, let's go to the team. And let's ask the team. I'm going to say you can go, but what should you do when you get back? And what the team decide, I gave him three options. The player can, nothing happens. He just plays as normal. Second is he runs. 
uh, whatever you know we decide. And the the third is um, he just won't start. He gets to play, but he won't start. So those are kind of our three things. And the team said uh, he won't start. He can play, but maybe just not start. Somebody was at practice. Well, Dad was not happy about that at all. He was being punished, unfairly punished. And I explained to him he missed practice. If it were, you know, I didn't have to bring it to the team. I thought the team would be kind of lenient with him as part of the reason I did it. Um, but I've had rules in the past where if you miss the day before practice, you, you don't play in the game. I mean, some coaches have that. This was football is his love. That's he's going to go to school there. He's getting a scholarship. This is a big deal. This isn't a kid just saying, I, I want to go to the movies. So we worked it out, but dad wasn't happy. That was a phone call. He called me. And I just explained it. And I said, this is what the team decided. That's what we're going to go with. And he said, well, I'm going to agree to disagree with you on it, but I you know, appreciate your time. Um, that happens really rare. I didn't think I needed to have a parent meeting for that. So I used my discretion, but that's one time in four years where I didn't say, let's set up a meeting. So, I mean, that might be a, a little, not quite the same, but a little bit along those lines of, will you mute them about anything? Most of the time, but every once in a while, I think you do have to make an exception. So I know that, that was, yeah, that was a, a long approach, but I, I, I try to think through each step of the way. And I'm a very proactive coach. I do not like being blindsided by things. I don't like um, being reactive to things. I try to think, how can I paint this in the best positive, but true picture? And then how can we build on that? So we talk a lot with our players about communicating with your parents about telling them, you know, if you know, you're not going to play, you can let them know ahead of time. That will save us all a little bit of a headache. If you, I had a, I had a player in college uh, one time, he didn't play. We won by 30 points and he didn't play. And the dad came down and I, you know, I thought he was going to slug me. Um, he was so mad. And I said, well, your son's been failing two classes for the last two weeks. I told him to call you and let you know, because he had to come two and a half hours to watch him play. I told him to call you. He knew he wasn't going to play three days ago. Didn't he call you? And the, the parents anger flipped from me to him, uh, to the, to the player right away. But the, in the parents mind, I was the bad guy. I was, you know, I was the one, I let the player decide if you want to dress, you can dress. You're not playing though. Maybe I should have taken that away from him and just said, you don't get to dress, but I did for whatever reason. Um, and dad wanted to take that out on me until he found out his kids failing two classes. So, um, so that's, uh, that's kind of how I approach everything. How can we be proactive as possible and make this a good experience for everybody? Um, I don't want it to be a bad experience, but also know that not everybody gets to play. It, it, we want to be competitive. We want to win. And that means that some guys aren't going to get playing time or not going to be starters, that kind of stuff. That kind of thing. So I'll stop there for a second and at, open it up to you guys. Anything that I said there that you want to know more about, or you just want to say, Hey, this is how I do it. You can interject in that because I'm not saying my approach is the best or the only, just the way that I've done it. No, I, um, I started opening it up last year to like everything. And I found out that it just, it got rid of a lot of our problems. Mm. Um, I didn't end up I didn't end up meeting about the um, all league thing because I had already really put in the newspaper why the girl had got the one of the girls on our team got it before this other one. And it was all my reasons were listed in the paper. OK, and I said I don't really need to have a meeting about that because, and, you know, unless they specifically but they specifically want to know why their daughter didn't get it. So maybe I maybe I should have had it just to smooth it over because I've probably got like a, a parent right now that I don't have um, on my, on my side. I mean, she did graduate last year, but like you can still cause yourself problems going in the future. So maybe that opening it up to most everything, like you said, would be, would be better, but the pandemic hit and I didn't meet with that parent because of that. And then, um, it just kind of slowly died. Yeah, but, uh, there, there were a lot of things, you know, due to the pandemic that just shut us down. You know, we usually have a coaches meeting at the end and our banquet and we did, we just didn't get a chance to do any of those things. Yeah. Um, so I think 
in some ways, you know, whether that's the full reason or partial, it's, it's an understandable reason that you didn't go and revisit it. And, and really, you know, a week later, the tempers have probably cooled down and not as big of a deal. So hopefully it doesn't come back on you, but I think it's, it's totally appropriate to say, Hey, you know, we couldn't meet there. It wasn't possible in that situation. Yeah. I had a question. I have a, um, my assistant coach who's on the school board, he's, he's been the girls assistant coach for the last five, six years. Um, his daughter graduated this year. So now he's going to be my volunteer assistant. His son's a sophomore, but, um, uh, great guy. He's much like your dad. I was thinking that your dad, even though we're not related, small business owner, you know, he's got some time. He he's tied in the community on the school board, just wants to be around his kids and, and, uh, uh, so far, he's doing a great job. Very, very helpful. But he's concerned about, you know, watching the, all the boys games last year because his son was a freshman, played a little bit um, about a parent at last year's team and the coach. He, he was there for one year um, and they, they were kind of full court press, shot a lot of threes. I've been watching some games. I finally got the huddle link this week from my AD. So I was able to watch some games and pretty undisciplined. You know, I, I don't think I, I watched three games. I don't think I saw one possession more than three passes and they're jacking up okay. shots. Most of them pretty bad shots, you know, so totally different than my philosophy. Like we're, you know, the closer you can get to the basket, we shoot it. It's fine. The driving kick open three, fine, but not this one dribble pull up in front of a guy or one pass and right in front of a defender and a lot of bad shots well we have one of our best players back he's probably our best three-point shooter was last year too but he, his dad my assistant coach is concerned about his dad he's kind of the dad apparently it sits in the bleachers and takes the stats and you know oh, yeah. wants to get him oh, shot so um, I was just kind of, I, I don't, I haven't met the dad. I don't know if it's going to be a problem. My assistant coach is, is, you know, concerned enough about it that he's brought it up to me two or three times. It'll be interesting how Broden's dad reacts because he, he's seeing our practices and he, he's knowing that I'm going to be a little bit more disciplined approach to our offense, mm -hmm. work the ball around, um, and that kind of thing. So, um, if you, I was just kind of going to pick your guys' brain. If you've had that parent maybe going into a season that you knew it was important for their kids to get that 20 points a game or, or to jack up a bunch of shots, if how do you, if you're, you're prepared for those meetings or if you have conversations with those kids, I mean, I'll, I'm a pretty direct, blunt, make it pretty obvious is this is what we're going to do. If you're going to take bad shots, you'll be on the bench next yep. to me. You just, I don't care. You know, that's just the way it's going to be. We're not going to, you know, it's just like uh, I was watching also on the puddle, you know, they gave up so many transition layups because no one's sprinting back. I said, you know, you're going to be on the bench next to me. These we're not going to allow these things. These mm -hmm. are non-negotiable. We are going to do these simple things. So anyways, I just had that question. If you guys had any experience with a potential uh, problem uh, that you were aware about and how you, how you might, if you're in my shoes, uh, consider approaching that. Maybe some of my communications with the kid before, this, you know, as we're getting the season going. Well, from my perspective, how I handle it is, is I don't really go through the parents. I go through the kids because I coach right. them. And so, like, we make sure that it's kind of like some of the things you guys were talking about with communication, that we let the kids know what shots they should be taking. And if they're not taking what you want them to take, then they're going to be out of the game like you talked about. Um, because, I mean, you know, you can, have a, you can have a talk with a parent about a situation like that. And I, I don't know that that would – I don't think um, – that would be hard for that not to go south, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't want to have any discussion with the parent, pre, yeah. pre parent. I, I'm, I'm along the lines of you, Dwayne. I, I, I think just more about communicating with, with the kid and setting up that expectation. I mean, obviously, we're going to do that through our practice, and, and he's going to probably get the point there. But, you know, if we get through the first two or three games and, I, and I'm pulling his son out, I, I'm a man and he's not. And, and his son's not going home and, and dad's saying, well, why aren't you shooting threes? I'm pretty sure I'm going to get that meeting request, you know, or, or maybe my assistant coach thinks that the possibility is there. Yeah. So if I can communicate with that kid and then like you were saying, uh, Matt, about sending that and communicate with your parents, let them know how we do things. Things are different this year. Mm -hmm. We're different. Our philosophy is different. It's not the same as it was last year. Nothing wrong with Coach Robinson's philosophy last year. It's just different. All coaches do things different. You know, and, and I've been very clear with my kids so far in our meetings and our, our practices that we're doing things different, but I don't throw the last guy on the bus. I don't know the guy, you know, I mean, right. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, just, just, 
but we do things different now. So, well, I I do a couple of things at the beginning of the year and may may help with a parent that you know might be an issue. Um, I think it's just a matter of of having your reasons and being confident in your reasons. You're right. Your assistant's probably right that that is going to come up at some point. Um, you know, I had a, a case last year where where my JV coach, his son was a senior for us. And I ended up pulling him out of a game because he, um, he made kind of a gesture threw his hands up at me when I was talking to him and we're not going to have that in a game. So come have a seat. Well, his dad who sits on the bench with me, the JV coach was not happy with me. And that's the same way I coach everybody. Everybody, if you're going to make gestures, you're going to respond to referees. If you're going to, you know, run your mouth, you're not going to be in the game. So I felt very confident even though it was, you know, hard to have to communicate that with the dad and he's in my program and all that stuff. Um, but two things that I do with my players that may be beneficial um, for the player. The first is um, we vote on playing time. And what I mean by that is we do this kind of a heads up, seven up. And I tell the kids, I will coach you however you want to be coached, this team. Um, so your, your first option is I will coach everybody to play equal minutes. We'll divide all the minutes up in the game and I'll play you all equal and win or lose, you all get to play. The second is I will play to win. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put the players in who I think give, the best, give us the best chance of competing and winning. That means not everybody will play all the same. I said, so now we, I want you to put your heads down, close your eyes, this is anonymous and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands. And I said, I'm fine coaching either way. I will coach so everybody gets equal playing time. I've done youth basketball, you know, um, but I'm also, I like to win. So it's your choice. And, and we have not vote. I've never had a kid vote for equal playing time. I've done that for eight years. I've never had a kid. And then I, so I ask him after that, I say, all of you voted that will, you, you trust me to sub and to try to compete and win. I need you to go home and tell your parents that. I want you to tell your parents that not everybody's really going to play good. equal. And I'm not telling any of you who's going to play and who isn't because we're not at a game yet. This is like the first couple of days of practice. Um, but I need you to go and communicate that to your mom and dad so that they know that there's a chance you may not play all of you. Um, and I don't know how many of them go home and communicate to their parents because I don't ask them to report that to me. But what I do know is that um, they know the expectation. They know that they voted as a team, just like what kind of shooting shirt do we want? Sometimes I leave that up to seniors. Other times I open it up for a vote. You voted on this one. This is the one we're getting. I don't want anybody to complain about it. We all voted on it. Um, so, so that's one thing. The second thing, and then we'll end this call so I can open up the next one. Um, the second thing I do is to talk about how teammates can be cancerous sometimes. And what I mean by that is uh, cancer grows and festers when something feeds it. So you can sit in the locker room and you can complain and, and a, a teammate can sit there and listen and do nothing. They can agree with you or they can, um, they can tell you, you need to go talk to coach. And I said, there's really only one right answer because even the kid who sits there and listens um, that, that complainer, now thinks they have a voice and they think they have an ally. So they're grown. And now you go tell us a third person. And even if they sit there and listen, they may, they disagree, but the person complaining believes they've got a couple of people on their side, but ultimately the coach decides who plays. So you can agree with them and cause division. You can sit there and be quiet and probably cause division, or you can say, you know what, you really need to go talk to coach about that. Now they know you're not being mean to them. You're just giving them advice because there's one person that controls playing time and that's the coach. So those are two things I do with my players early on. I think helps out a tone. Very good. But coaches, Helpful. I'm going to leave it there. I got the next presenter texting me right now. So I need to run over and open his thing up. So thank you so much.